Um, welcome everybody for the second second day of our our art of research conference on on behalf of the of the organizing committee as one of the cha chairs um, I, I am an honor to introduce our um, second keynote speaker dr. Dorita Hanna today and and um, it's been always a tradition in this art of research conference that one of the keynotes is kind of representing um, pres kind of our own institution comes from within an in-house person um, from a faculty member of Alto Arts but paradoxically this Dorita Hanna who this year is our in-house woman maybe comes from the one of the furthest spots on the hemisphere that you possibly can travel to this remote spot of Espo. Uh, Dorita comes from uh, Tasmania now she's uh, presently there uh, works as a, as a research uh, professor um, of um, in, in, interdisciplinary architecture, art, and design at the University of Tasmania in Hobart, but she is also affiliated with our uh, department, Department of Film and, and Scenography, here at Aalto Arts. Dorita worked as a professor our, at our department for for a year, and then after that stayed as an as an adjunct professor so she meets this this criteria of an in-house person even though she comes so from so far and Dorita comes from an island and and I think this theme of islands and different kinds of floating and peripheric low key is is kind of the theme that defines her work and uh, presently, Dorita is also um, a member of a, of a research project that uh, really recently um, launched uh, called Floating Peripheries, uh, which got um, Academy of Finland funding that's uh, happening at our department. And uh, these islands keep coming up. When I'm accepting Dorita's travel expenses at the department, I learn about islands I've never heard. And I don't think there's any, uh, any island on this planet that Dorita wouldn't have had gone to, <laughs> to visit it. Um, and these kind of on-site performances, localized acts, interventions and disturbances is, is kind of what defines Dorita's performative art work in the realm of extended scenography. And this is also the unbeaten path she, tra she travels as a thinker, maker, theorist of per performance design and this kind of notion of extended um, scenography and and soon very soon if not even already uh, we will be able to read her writing in a in a soon to be published book book event space theater architecture and the historical avant-garde which will be published by Routledge very soon I, I haven't understood and also during this conference we can we can see Dorita's artwork, an installation called Phone Home in, the, in this exhibition, so please check that out. So I think Dorita's presentation, Dorita's keynote uh, lecture will, will give, illuminate uh, her, her key, key aspects, her, her work better than I can. So please uh, join me in warmly welcoming our second keynote speaker, Dorita Hanna. Thanks so much. I, I'm not too loud, am I? I? I sound loud to myself. Anyway, it's great to be here and thank you very much for your lovely introduction. And also, you did help me put into perspective 
what I'm talking about, because it is very much about islands, actually, um, and I didn't realise just how haunted this presentation is by islands. So um, it's great to be here, and it's always great to um, be part of Alto. I um, I'm very appreciative. Um, so I'm going to talk about my my what I call a, my critical spatial practice, and I've titled this "Critical Is as Critical Does." Um, which you might recognise from Forrest Gump, stupid is as stupid does. I can't believe in this uh, lecture I'm actually citing two sort of popular Hollywood movies, um, neither of which I particularly loved, but, but I think there's something interesting in, in some of the statements and titles. So um, really it's basically about... Um, uh, something really enacting criticality, so a practice that enacts criticality. Uh, and um, my own work is based very much on um, space and performance, looking at, at performance design and spatial performativity. Can this be turned down a bit? It's not possible, is it? It's just feel... Am I too loud? I feel too loud. Oh, OK, that's good. All right, that's good. Um, so, uh, how, was it, how space and performance come together? It, it, it began as architecture and theatre and became, as I became more and more interested in performance theory as a, as a much more extended way of looking at the world, a lens for looking at the world, I became interested in space and performance. Um, it, the, the, this includes um, performative spaces, which are um, sites as active public events. So that's architecture, thinking about architecture and built space um, as, a, as a sort of performative phenomenon. And we know now that built space and the built lived environment is also haunted um, or troubled or um, uh, necessarily intertwined uh, and entangled with the virtual um, also performance space, so um, I specialise in theatre architecture itself, uh, performing arts venues and um, performing spaces, aesthetic events that integrate art, architecture and design through this notion of scenography or scenografia, which uh, if you go back to the uh, earlier terms of scenografia, it was in fact an integration of art, architecture and design. Um, they couldn't be separated at that time. So I'm just going to quickly run through just to give you a sort of overview of my of, of my practice, but I'm going to focus on uh, the Phone Home project, which is, there's a little scrap of it out, out there, perched on a ledge, uh, but uh, I'm going to give you this overview and then, um, and then focus and really try and unpack something that's very fresh. Literally this month, phone home occurred this month. So, um, but I will be writing and uh, in the proceedings. So, if, if you want to read the sort of the theory and and maybe a more um, uh, informed <laughs> and intelligent view of it, then it'll be uh, in the proceedings. So, architecture, for example. This is the kind of theatre architecture that I work on and as a researcher I'm really interested all the time in making small spatial revolutions. So for example in this performing arts centre in New Zealand I was interested in how do you make an asymmetric theatre, what we call um, dynamic asymmetry which is not something that's often um, done in performance spaces but also how do you bring the outside in, how do you try and resist this, this um, uh, desire to hermetically seal off performance spaces. And I have to say, it's rather wonderful looking at you, but also looking at the trees outside and the sky outside. Um, one can sort of breathe more easily. So as a theatre architect, I often find myself feeling rather um, stifled by these spaces that I'm meant to specialise in. Also thinking, where do they begin and what's culturally specific about these spaces? And when does the event itself begin? When does the space itself begin? And this is a, a, a proposal for a performing arts centre in Wellington, New Zealand, for a community that has a very high demographic in Māori and Pacific Island uh, peoples and cultural practices. So thinking about how um, contemporary space in New Zealand can be informed much more by the peoples of that place. 
Um, and then thinking about Fitirea is the name of the uh, place and it means first light. So the idea of um, the sort of dawn ceremony and the canoes coming in at dawn and really thinking about um, the building being seen first from the harbour and, and experienced as a kind of relationship between the sea and the, and the city. And then the latest project that I've been working on is the Container Globe, um, which is actually, uh, these are some images for its proposal, but it's currently being um, uh, built in uh, Detroit. Um, and the guy I've been working with on this is the, um, he's the business manager for KISS. So it's a kind of rock and roll uh, Shakespearean space, but he's also a, a Shakespeareophile. And I don't think anyone knows more about Shakespeare than, than Angus Vale. Um, but he's also really interested in making this real people's place out of shipping containers. Um, and... Uh, and then some of my older work that goes back, this goes back to 2003, but this was the first project that I did at the Prague Quadrennial where I really started to think much more of how installations and events can rehearse more enduring structures. So how, how ideas about architecture and space can be played out through temporary disappearing acts such as this installation in the Quadrennial, which was called um, the Heart of PQ, a performance landscape for the centre and it was a kind of a labyrinth where I worked with over 50 artists from around the world to create this kind of complex assemblage marketplace space that then became a research environment for the performers. Um, and then in 2011, I was invited to cu curate and design the architecture section of the Prague Quadrennial. Um, and... Um, uh, I called it Now Next Performance at the Crossroads, and it was in, it was in the Crossroads, um, which is an old church, a decommissioned ancient, ancient church that is at the literal crossroads of Prague, and Václav Havel set it up as a, as a kind of place of cultural exchange. And this was the architecture section, and I have to say, the most delightful installation in it came from Finland, with Kokimo's um, installation, which sort of De defied a kind of uh, a, a, a prescribed space. But instead of hanging things on walls and trying to work out how to deal with this heritage building, I gave everybody a table. It was a kind of a gift. It was a gift from the Quadrennial, which um, I know Tim was talking about yesterday, this notion of the gift. And, um, and then you could install something in, on, around, under it, etc. But it actually became a site, a kind of spatial locale for every, each one of the 32 countries who were um, being represented. And so people responded to the tables in various ways, but the idea was that the table had to engage with the body. So I'm very interested in this notion of the body, the participating body of the spectator, as being absolutely inherent to the work. Um, and so downstairs were all these tables and upstairs was a space because if we're talking about performance space then it's really about people gathering. People gathering to, to, to think about the event and creating an event and the gathering itself being an event. So I had a spatial, an op what I called an open spatial laboratory for 21 PhD students that were selected from around the world and I also made a performance space in there um, which was based on a, around a long table um, and a sort of transversal arrangement of rostra. So again, the light came in from the outside. I made a sort of a, um, um, a booth for projection. Um, and then the, in, in two, that was in 2011, 2015, um, I co-curated Fluid States, which was for Performance Studies International. And instead of having one conference somewhere in the world uh, with about 500 to 700 delegates, we decided that if Performance Studies International wanted to be truly international, which in itself is an anomaly and a difficult thing to, to, to really achieve, uh, despite saying we're in a global world, um, then let's split it up. Let's, let's atomize 
the event into a festival of events across a year. So the idea of a year-long globally dispersed conference, not conference, a festival of events in, in isolated spaces or so-called far-flung spaces, far-flung to the centre. For some of us, it's home, it's our centre. So it was an idea of sort of decentering the centre through the peripheral. Um, which is why I'm so happy to be part of this Floating Peripheries um, uh, performance group here. So thinking about also the fact that, that, that often, this is where I come from, New Zealand, this is where I live, Tasmania, um, but the fact is, is that the map is often bifurcated to so the Pacific itself, which is the largest territory in the world, is, is sort of slips off to the edges and is completely marginalised. And yet it's full of hundreds of nation states and thousands and thousands of islands. Um, and, and so re really rethinking then about not thinking of the world through the continents, through the landforms, but thinking of the world through the oceanic, this interconnecting fluid um, material um, that is is incredibly problematic and contested in this particular um, c contemporary condition we find ourselves in in relation to climate change, as well as sort of acidification and plastication, and we know about the Pacific gyres, for example. So these events took place over the year in these different places, far flung, seemingly far-flung places, and the one that I particularly um, directed, co-directed, was the, the one in Rarotonga in the Cook Islands, working with a wonderful local artist called Arnie O'Neill. And it could not have been made possible without Arnie as the, um, what uh, Giatri Spivak would call the native informant, the local informant. Um, because she really knew the time of the island. She knew the spatiality and what they call the um, vata, the space time of, of the island. So it was called Sea Change, Performing a Fluid Continent. So the idea was how can performance actually enact and discuss these issues that are incredibly important and pressing in the Pacific at the moment. And taking this island, which you can drive around in half an hour in a car, it's got a ring road, um, with beautiful mountains in the middle, um, how, can you, how can you come to know the place through the festival? So over three days, we um, looked at the different... Uh, tr tr we occupied the different tribal districts of the island. So we, we had very we had different ways of engaging um, by boat, swimming in the water, walking along the coast, um, driving in buses, uh, various ways of having a sort of embodied engagement to come to know to really come to the know the place through these situated performances. And my own uh, performance that I did in this was the Island Bride, which I called an anthropocenic figure in the landscape. And she was based on these um, ghost nets that are found in the sea, the problematic ghost nets that come adrift from fishermen's boats and, and trap um, marine life as well as trash. And thinking about this kind of um, bio-agent of, um, of this and, and working with a, an artist from Hobart, uh, Linda Ersig, who, who for her PhD was making these uh, biomorphs. So she was she was crocheting plastic rope that was found uh, um, in found spaces and um, in the case of Rarotonga found on the island and turning them into these kind of coralline ruffle forms that been, then became a kind of a, the, the costume for the bride or the garments for the bride. And the bride became this connecting figure through three local performers um, that actually connected um, the different events on the island over the three days in the three different spaces. So the first one was the original Miss Cook Islands from 1960, um, and she led us across um, uh, the, the, the fields of a royal palace. Um, another one was a kite surfer who, who greeted the um, people returning from a little island on a paddleboard and then um, dragged uh, her veil full of trash 
um, and, and Linda's biomorphs up to a little exhibition where Linda was exhibiting her work. And then Henry Afutarapo was the last bride in a, in a ruined Sheraton, um, which is an extraordinary site on the island. Um, so this was this idea too of, of sort of entanglement, a kind of a, a dramaturgy of Pacific spacing as a, as a very specific way of looking at time and space through the oceanic. I've also been very interested in food and the table and the notion, not so much of the dining room, but more and more the notion of the kitchen where work is done, where food is prepared and made. And working with um, Ken Bailey from the Design Studio for Social Intervention in Boston, who asks if kitchens were public spaces like sports fields and libraries, etc., um, how could they rearrange social life? So he's very interested in the notion of social room, making social room, making space for dialogue through um, the kitchen itself as a way of gathering people. So we uh, presented this in, in a brickwork studio in the city that had two doors between two streets and we put a long table and invited people from the street as well as invited guests to come and create a meal together. And there's Ken who was greeting people outside so that they could wash their hands before they went in. Um, and then everybody worked together to prepare food. But what they were doing, we had food like um, virgin sangria, stone soup, and, and these, these these uh, particular recipes were such that you could make it to suit your own taste. But you were, it was a sort of a, a shared pot, but at the same time, you could, um, it, it was acknowledging the diversity of tastes within the group. And it's this idea of a sort of a group that's together, but is also full of individuals that, that sort of stand apart and have their own place. So working between sort of sameness and diversity, a sort of a gathering and dispersion is, is pretty central as well to, to my talk today. Um, and we had this amazing bounty that was hanging from the ceiling and, and the lay, 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 ladening the table. And um, then at the end, everybody took, they were given paper bags and they took the food. So the food dispersed out into the city. So I'm very interested in this idea of performance design as a sort of notion, as, as Susanna said, of uh, scenography in the expanded field. Um, so not talking about things like sets and props and costumes, but objects, materials, images, gestures, environments, and thinking of them um, through embodiment, action, and the event. And also considering the participatory role of a co-creative audience. Um, it's, it's a sort of fluid and emerging field that provides a critical tool for reflecting and challenging worldviews. And also this notion of event space, uh, which is about to be published um, through Routledge, um, particularly looking at the historic avant-garde. Uh, so, I think you, it sounded like you said the hysterical avant-garde. But the historical avant-garde, in fact, have a kind of a certain hysteria or a certain chaotic engagement with uh, contemporary culture and modernism that countered modernism that gave rise to some very interesting spaces. So it's proposed that the built environment housing the event is itself an event and an integral driver of experience. And uh, so the concept of event space is located at this convergence between performance and architectural studies and it investigates spatial and performativity generally through performance space specifically in order to offer a more dynamic lens with which to view architecture but also inspire contemporary approaches to performance space. So sceno architectures and dance architectures, table talk, event space, all of these are sort of linked by this little hyphen. So I'm really interested in this, what I call the hyphenated zone. What does it mean to dwell in this hyphenated zone? And thinking about it is what Derrida would call spacing, a sort of space-time phenomenon, becoming space of time and the becoming time of space. That's what he called this, these kind of punctuations. Um, so also thinking about it in relation to this notion of the transversal zone. 
a kind of a material zone um, where we can come to um, engage in issues that might be difficult to engage with. Um, what what uh, Ail Weissman and Palantan called spaces of exception. Um, and we know that that things have shifted from a spatialization of time to a temporalization of space. So there's no one thing about s that defines space. Space is not a hom homogenous thing, and neither is time. It's all about multiplicity and fracturing and assemblage. Um, and as Liebeskin says, there is no space. There are only spaces, uh, which is a plurality and a heterogeneity and a difference. And that allows us to see spacing difference. So I love I love this term, spacing, that, and also applying this broad spectrum approach of performance studies that recognises that while not everything is a performance, everything can be studied as a performance. And this also comes from the, this notion of the performative, J.L. Austin's How to Do Things with Words, where he says there's a difference uh, in our saying that describes and our saying that enacts, the speech, speech acts that are performative as opposed to descriptive. So thinking about how spaces and things do, and that's what I'm interested in in relation to this idea of critical is as critical does. A, a spatial practice enacts criticality. It does criticality. Um, so... Um, I'll keep moving because, but thinking about this idea of a spatial practice in relation to Jane Rendell's um, notion too, uh, where I think it was 2003 where she talked about a critical spatial practice in allowing us to describe work that transgresses, transgresses the limits of art and architecture and engages both the social and the aesthetic, the public and the private. And then in 2011, um, we had um, Hirsch and Meeson, who then um, pr uh, published a series of books on critical spatial practice. Um, so the notion of the critical is not just analytical um, and a sort of distance regard, but it's really something that's crucial, that's serious, that's essential, that's life-threatening, where judgments are made and something is at stake. Uh, so this attempts to understand how the spatial arts act as act, uh, can act as active political agents and how space can fa facilitate political agency itself. Important in this time. So these are, I'm going to run very quickly through these because time is moving so quickly. It's weird, it always does that. Um, so what is a critical spatial practice? This is EPOS 257 who... Um, uh, came in in 2010 and built this um, 50 square metres of clearly unused public space and left it there for 51 days and no one knew what it was about or what it was for. So they were actually talking about what really is public space and who does it belong to. Um, uh, this is a beautiful project that was made called 185 Empty Chairs after the Christchurch um, earthquake. A beautiful memorial that's still there even though it was temporary, but that, that looks at the, the sort of moment and monument, the temporality and the fleeting in a sort of idea of monumentality and memorialisation um, for the 185 people who died in the, earth, uh, the Christchurch earthquake. And people, the community is still sort of maintaining these chairs um, even today. And this beautiful and I, f I find very deeply moving uh, project in New Zealand, recognising the 606 people who've committed suicide over the last year, just through the simple gesture of, of each one's shoes being represented in, in this grid, in this landscape of... Um, of this, these kind of absent body, um, uh, um, what do you call them, bio-objects. Um, a, a very sort of, I find a very profound and for me a, absolutely a critical spatial practice. We're aware of um, the Maldives government that had their underwater cabinet meeting in order to sign a declaration that they took to the climate accord in, in Copenhagen back in 2009. This really is the government of the Maldives islands and that really is the president signing it. 
And for me, an extraordinary moment of sort of critical spatiality happened um, days after Trump was inaugurated with um, this, the kind of the pussy hats that were these individual hats that proliferated not just in Washington but in various spaces in the United States and around the world, including the Antarctic, and actually formed a kind of spatial inhabitation or occupation of, of criticality and of dissent. Thinking about this in relation to sort of the idea of the media and, and a sort of media, mediated irreality that we're in now, um, where, uh, as John McKenzie says, we live in a designed environment in which an array of global performances unfold, and what do we do with these sort of proliferating screens and images. So images like these have been very important to my work, the work I've been doing with a choreographer since 2002, um, looking at the body itself as a potential bomb, here with a Palestinian youth lifting his um, T-shirt at a, at a checkpoint, or the tragedy of the Dubrovka Theatre in 2002 when um, 900 people were taken hostage and um, and the authorities came in, uh, and what they did was in this theatre they actually pumped in a narcotic gas that ended up killing 120 people who couldn't get the um, uh, uh, what's it called the antidote exactly, and so 120 people died plus the 50 um, Chechen rebels who were killed by the Spetsnaz soldiers. For, so for me, a very profound moment because the theatre, which which I specialise in designing, became a perfect space for pop barricade hostage taking because of how it controls the public. And then this notion of how the sky itself becomes a screen with the Sterot cinema in 2014, where people in the village of Sterot in Israel watched the bombing of Gaza as if they were watching a screen and, and, and actually compared it to watching the World Cup. Um, and actually forming an auditorium. So this sort of notion of the fact that the screen is no longer just, you know, uh, here and in our pockets and extensions of our bodies, but, but somehow it's, it's ever-present. And then images like this of Aysay Gokhan, the mayor of Nasaybin, who actually went on a nine-day hunger strike in the um, no-man's land uh, space between um, uh, where uh, the Turkish uh, government were building a wall that she called a wall of shame between the Kurds and the Syrians. And so she sat in this zone which gathers trash, um, this, this sort of in-between space until they agreed to stop building it. But also thinking about the people who were there to support her on both sides. So thinking of the borderline then not as a line and the way that a screen is not just a sort of a simple skin, but thinking of it as, as I said earlier, this notion of a state of exception and, and how to deal with the objectality of the borderline or of architecture, which, is, which, which Lefebvre calls this kind of mute resistant object, uh, and replacing it with Deleuze's idea of the objectile, something that, that's, in, in, uh, that's a sort of theatre of matter becoming through the event. So, back to this image. This is the researcher. The researcher is standing uh, on... Standing on the cliffs with five other researchers. One of them sitting in the audience. Oh, the wheel, the wheel of death is going around. So this, this is an event that took place at dawn um, where the researchers uh, came to the fossil cliffs and, and looked at how they could watch the review, the, regard the view together and alone, taking different stances in the landscape um, and therefore sort of just exploring really with their bodies different ways of watching the view. And then with these emergency blankets um, standing on the edge of the cliff, uh, swathed in them and enjoying looking directly into the light. Um, 
through the thin plastic of the emergency blanket. Um, and this was part of intervening in the Anthropocene. And again, four people who, of these 30 people who gathered are, are here today, so that's fantastic, um, came all the way to Mariah Island, which is a little island off Tasmania, um, off the larger island continent of Australia, for this performance design event uh, intervening in the Anthropocene, uh, which was a workshop of events where we asked questions, um, how can art design and events contribute to redrawing maps differently to represent comings and goings, meetings and partings, in order to register essential actions that incubate sociality? And how can we free our senses to occupy landscapes differently, not as distant, passive spectators, but as immersed mobile bodies creatively endowing our inherited environments and despoiled chores to uncover more transversal dialogues and meaning? So, um, uh, we started off with uh, Campbell Drake's uh, wonderful spatial tuning, where somebody tuned a, a, a piano, an old piano, broken down piano, while we looked at the, um, uh, uh, at the dump, um, the Hobart landfill. And so we became attuned not just to the sound of the birds and the, and the uh, machines moving, uh, but, uh, but also the, the various smells and sounds of the landscape. And then uh, this uh, intervening in the, this um, uh, work with these sentinels was part of it, working with this emergency blanket. This is an emergency blanket that it was invented by NASA. This is one that's floating that came a, a, apart from a, um, a satellite. And this is our one that came apart from our little uh, gathering and Sean chasing it to make sure it doesn't go into the sea. But the, this blanket is something that's sort of a, a kind of a heroic garment in a way, in the way that it clothes um, it, it, uh, the uh, athlete but also the way it's become to be known with the um, uh, in, in relation to refugees and the sort of very thin um, metallic uh, shining um, garment um, that also was utilized in this event for raising money associated with one of Ai Weiwei's events around um, refugees um, um, Charlize Theron and um, one of the women from Pussy Riot um, but so there's this sort of heroic image that comes out of this shining material. Um, and somebody actually suggested it as a, a, um, a making a house, the most basic house, from the thinnest of plastic films. Um, uh, but in effect, the reality of it is this. You know, this kind of proliferation on these shores where people are literally washed up um, and, and leaving these remains behind. So what in the end becomes the home? It, in the end, it can be just as simple as this, as this um, plastic sheeting and, and things that keep your money and your passport dry. And so I'm very interested in um, what's happening at the moment. Well, actually ashamed. I'm ashamed to live in Australia in relation to what's called the Pacific Solution with refugees um, who are being withheld and detained on islands. And these are the images, again, that proliferate on the internet of looking at people looking through this, these uh, nettings and this kind of curious in-between zone. These were taken last week on Manus Island. I don't know if you've heard about the trouble of Manus Island trying to close it down. But thinking, and this is from a, an article in the New York Times, refugees trapped far from home. Um, so veteran United Nations officials said the, uh, th this month, they've never seen a wealthy democracy go to such extremes to punish asylum seekers and push them away. So I feel like it's important somehow to, to kind of engage critically with this. And then thinking of um, this figure again um, as... Uh, well, it's not working, but anyway, uh, this figure as a sort of flaming figure in the landscape. Um, and um, 
Louise Bourgeois' uh, beautiful Stellenset memorial to the um, people who were um, burnt as witches in the north of Norway, um, and also with the fire, and also this is an Aboriginal artist, um, uh, Julie Goff, who had the flaming chair with a spear in it on Bruny Island in Tasmania, and then thinking of the flaming figure. So I was asked to make an installation um, of in, in this building about fire, commemorating fire, linking it to sort of the remains of the fire, and um, deciding that uh, working with one of my PhD students um, and fellow artist, Sean Coyle, to make something that acknowledged uh, Omid Masumali, who um, uh, set himself a fire in protest, and thinking of him then as this flaming figure, the figure of Icarus, who fell into the sea in Crete, where so many people are now falling into the sea. Um, uh, from from the boats full of refugees and this notion of Icarus who who had the hubris to think he could escape and have a better life and then the lament for Icarus and this va famous painting originally attributed to Bruegel the Elder that's called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus well where is Icarus there's Icarus so the fact that we can no longer see the people falling into the sea, we can no longer, we can no longer really, they're not in our view, even though they're absolutely in our view. So making this installation in this space, um, which is no, room number one, where the, uh, the spectators have to look through the doors of room number three and two to see the image of um, this flaming figure in the other room. But also looking again, uh, turning uh, our gaze back on the person gazing, and how the, um, you know, this time the viewer in the gallery becomes um, somebody gazing between these layers. Also, um, the Omid Masumali's um, death was recorded on mobile phones by refugees in the camp. So then thinking of the role that the phone plays, perhaps really being the phone. Um, uh, perhaps really being the home and thinking and then coming up with this idea of where is the home and phone home because refugees rely so much on these phones. They are so critical um, and um, they're things that they show off cherished like fine crystal. So they're, they're incredibly important for them to connect. And this is a video, I won't play it, but of one of the children of Nauru talking about how can you deny us phones? We're, not pr we're treated like prisoners. We came for a better life, and now we can't even get on, we can't even use telephones. But here she's Skyping. So there's sort of very limited use of phones. And so creating this um, uh, um, installation for the Chile Biennale that was earlier this month called uh, themed on the idea of the unpostponable. By taking these refugee cabins and turning them into models that, f ha that house a telephone. And so that, and within a glass mirrored box, and then, so the whole thing is scaled around a telephone within which the video is showing. So we asked people to um, uh, submit um, videos and we selected nine of them from around the world from um, and all of them are in some way dealing with bodies that are detained um, in some way. Um, Island Icarus was turned into a piece called You Peeled Our Skin Off which is what Masumali was screaming as he set fire to himself which is a sort of highest form of mental torture in Farsi. Um, this wonderful piece that was um, made by um, a Behruz Buchani uh, on a contraband phone in Mont Manus Island and snuck out. This piece that was made by the Experimental Theatre of Tra Thrace in the De Evros Delta where refugees are drowning. Drone footage of, of homes, of burnt out, um, destroyed homes, etc., etc. And this is vigil by uh, Australian Aboriginal artist um, uh, uh, Tracy Moffat, where people are uh, stills from movies where people are looking out of their windows at the horrors that's happening outside but still safe behind their windows. 
But the fact is, is that through this reflectivity and then looking through the mirrored, uh, through the the the, um, the bars, we have to then mediate our gaze. Um, and this was as it was installed in. Um, in Chile, where you had to kneel, you had to kneel to see it. So again, the body, it was the first thing you saw when you came into the exhibition, were these figures kneeling and negotiating the gaze. So if you give it a try out there, you'll see that it's this, this way of trying to come to see it between the bars and the image beyond and the mirrored images inside. And then, of course, people, I love it, taking, to using their mobile phones to take photos of these videos that are inside on mobile phones. But using the mirror to also reflect the endless uh, uh, lineup of these cabins that are proliferating around the world in refugee camps as the most basic form of um, housing. Uh, and then for me, it's about people, how people gather to look at these, um, to really engage. Um, and as I say, to be to, to kind of have this mediating gaze where you want to immerse yourself in it, but you want to critically distance yourself from it. And, um, and it's been put yesterday on a ladder, today on some steps. You can come up and have a look at it perched, just one of them with the nine videos um, perched inside. And there we have Caleb, who's here, perched on top. Thank you very much, Caleb. So I just want to finish by saying that John McKenzie, in his wonderful uh, essay in performance design on global feeling, um, talked about a resistant, said that a resistant performativity cannot do without a global feeling of political love. What is that? Well, he was referring to Hart and Negri, who talk about this kind of uh, uh, ability to engage with political love that's not familial, but that is an ability to feel a part of the world and feeling apart from it at the same time. And so it's this uh, inhabiting this transversal zone where you're both immersed in something but also critically distanced of it. The space of exception, which I think is the space of critical practice, where you are a part of and you're apart from. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dorita, for your wonderful talk. And um, we will um, open the room for questions. And uh, I think we have the first one there. We have a microphone. Wow. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, first I want to say how much I appreciate the generosity of your talk. You know, the multiple other artists that you acknowledged, not only collaborators, but, you know, other people out there doing their work. So I think that was, that was just lovely. Um, are you aware of the work of Juliana Bruno? By any chance? Yes, I am, in relation to film and... Yeah, yeah. so, so um, one of her most recent books is, is about surface. So my question ah, for you is yeah. how, the, you know, materiality plays into the way that you consider space performing and maybe specifically in relation to this idea of surface as a sort of a moment where materials kind of meet each other. Yes. Just interested in your thoughts on that. Um, no, it's it's a good, it's a really good question. And surface, I think, is an, a, a, interesting. And we've been looking at this with the, the, the work I'm doing with the master's students too, like looking at the screen and thinking of its very surface as being a materiality. Um, and how do we look at that? And then, you know, for me, the surface of the, of the a blanket, for example, it's literally just a... Um, um, what is it? It's 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 the thinnest of um, it's just a vapor, literally a vapor of aluminium that's put on a film and peeled off. So, um, but the, but also the materiality of it. So, thinking about the sea, which we often uh, uh, regard as the surface too, this glittering surface, but how you know it tells its many stories. So, I've also been writing about the Pacific in relation to sort of navigation and. Um, uh, you know, the, this, this ability to kind of find your way in the world through understanding the complexities of the surface with the changing um, currents and the changing wind 
patterns and cloud patterns, etc., and how Pacific navigators navigate without any um, technical technical uh, equipment or GPS and they're still doing it today and the, the, the voyages, there are seven of them that are, are moving around the world and actually uh, to, to, to make climate change and the problematics in the Pacific more, more um, visible. So, yeah, I think surface and materiality, absolutely. Um, and the same with this ocean, notion of transversal space. It's also, if I had more time, to talk a very material space. But thank you. Any other questions? Anybody? Any hands up? There. Yeah, there. There was one. Right in front of you. Okay. Yes, yeah, she's... To trying to turn on. on the microphone. <laughs> there it is. I can see the lights on. Is it, is it working? I can I can run with this one. I also really appreciated your talk and and the scope that it involved. My I I'm I actually am still struggling to formulate my question, but I think. It's about engaging with the relationship between uh, critical and politicized content that is a representation mm. and then critical and politicized content that is somehow or another actually intervening in systems directly with the express purpose of transformation. Right. And, I, and I'm intrigued because it feels to me like your work straddles these two approaches. And I'm wondering, because I'm interested in species of criticality, so I'm really thinking about how artists, because I'm, I, I think we're tasked increasingly with moving beyond representation, mm, mm. but doing so in a way that's non-instrumentalized, if that makes sense. So that actually, you know, for instance, thinking about experimentation and, and the, the scope of that. But I think... My question is how, as a practitioner, uh, also as a, as a theorist, um, not that these things are mutually exclusive, but how do you sort of work across this idea of representation of critical content on the one hand and then critical interventions that are really about transformation? You know, it's a really, it's a really good question, actually. And I have to say that, you know, if you're talking about like the Pacific solution, living in Australia with this, it's, it's very frustrating because the, 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 the inability to truly intervene physically. Like I talked to Rachel Fensham, who's a dance um, theorist and professor in Melbourne, and we, 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 we said, let's just go and sleep outside one of the detention centres, right? Let's just go and be there. But you can't. It's just completely impossible. It's so patrolled. You know, so there, there is this kind of uh, uh, withholding of the ability for the body itself to, to critically engage in a way um, uh, with, with the people on the islands. So um, I think just in relation to this particular project, uh, you know, because it was a biennale that was themed around this idea of the unpostponable, we wanted to bring something that was... Not, I mean, the, the, the biennale was full of screens. You got screen fatigue very quickly. But... Uh, phone home had a much more direct and embodied engagement. I understand that's not necessarily answering your question, but for me, this ability to have something that asks people to linger longer, to be a kind of community staring through, to try and understand the work that's not, um, you know, that's not um, sort of obviously politically discursive because there's a range of different images and experiences. Um, but... Yeah, the direct engagement is the thing that, 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 say, the Australian government has really withheld from people too. So, um, for me, it's one way uh, of doing it. But I understand what you're saying, because I feel that in terms of a critical spatial practice of some of the practices I showed, we need to kind of get out more into the field and engage much more in sort of public space with those issues. Any um, one more question and your hands hands up anyone am I seeing everyone oh, yeah. okay Tim I'm running up <laughs> I 
Yes, thank you for that. I, I could ask just, just one small question. At some point halfway through your talk, you talked about how everything now had to be, we had to think in terms of pluralities rather than singularities. Right. Not space, but space is not yes. time, but times and so on. And I wondered about that because um, difference is one thing and diversity is another. Uh, and um, you can talk about heterogeneity uh, in a world in which everything is different and everything is differentiating without having to fragment that world into bits. And I think that it's a politically dangerous move to do that kind of fragmentation, to suppose that the world is all broken up into pieces because then we no longer bear a common responsibility for it. I mean, surely to talk about... We, we can talk about a world in common and still recognise that it's a world of infinite difference. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you completely, but I don't think that um, breaking something into bits is... is, is um, I mean, I, I do think it is the reality. I guess for me as an architect, it was this amazing moment of realisation where... Um, you know, we're always thinking of space as just this one totalizing thing, and and architecture has generally been this thing that that also um, spatializes time. So to then think about it as being something that is broken up allows us to look at the multiplicity of of the reality within which we're living, and um, and also you know screens as as. I know in relation to your talk yesterday, Tim, you know, that this idea of, you know, this sort of the, the role that, that now technology is playing in our lives is, is kind of, I guess, problematic in relation to these issues of, attra of attraction and distraction. But it's the reality. It is the reality. And how do, we, how do we work with this reality? And I'm really interested in how you do that in a way to understand it so that you have a much more empathic engagement. So rather than going, oh, screens are really problematic, how do you sort of engage with them in a way... Um, through, through recognising this multiplicity, can actually bring people together. But also, as you know, I was interested not just in bringing people together, but bringing them together as individuals with diverse voices, acknowledging difference, even though I understand that there, you know, we could talk about the difference between difference and diversity. So I don't think thinking of things as being multiplicitous is necessarily... Uh, a bad thing. I, I actually think it's the reality of our times. So, um, and I think the more we think about that as a kind of complex um, bits, as Georges Perec called it, you know, that, 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 that things are made out of, of bits, which are both um, digital bits and real bits, um, you know, I think maybe then we can try and talk to people who we're, at, with our project, calling the sort of the familiar alien, much more interested in talking to the familiar alien, the, the, the neighbour you, you know, you just can't um, really have a conversation with rather than the echo chamber that's occurring through technology and social networking, etc. Anyway, we can talk about it because... I kind of agree and disagree, so... Are there any, any hands, any, any last, one more last bit <laughs> of, of a question? I, I, I just wanted to make a comment, this is not really a question, more like a, like a no, because I, I was thinking someone after, uh, after Tim's talk yesterday asked about this kind of, in relation to this idea of paying attention, about this kind of ritualistic, idea and, and, and somehow this, these site-specific performances, like have you ever thought about this kind of like really ancient, like even like pre-art or things that weren't even intended to be any artworks, kind of this, these like prophets in these odd acts in the city corners that were kind of these acts of mm -hmm. odd acts that were meant to be like making us to pay attention something to something that is not here and now it's something that is really beyond the kind of the, the presence that what we kind of observe in our daily life. 
Absolutely. The, the work that are the, the dance architecture events I've been doing with Carol Brown, which we call Tongues of Stone, you know, how to make the city speak, are looking at those. They're looking at the lost spaces and the forgotten spaces in the city and threading audiences through listening on headphones to a, a sort of soundscape, as well as the accidental passerby that joins in. But the idea that we were looking at was uh, uncovering buried histories, talking, for example, in Perth about pre-colonial um, Perth and the and the younger peoples who were there and and their mythologies and the ways they looked at place and space and um, you know I think when you talk about prophets um, I'm really interested in that kind of mythological dimension as well um, to the everyday where it takes on a sort of a an expanded dimension um, as well so yeah I think it's but I think your question is really good. I'd like to go deeper into that, actually. Thank you. Let's uh, thank Dorita Hanaf one more time.